So if we broadly separate these as myotendinous properties versus myofascial properties, again, what we're looking for here is, is not necessarily prioritizing one or the other for the sake of doing so. We're looking at having compatibility and balance between these two broad systems, uh, depending on who the athlete is, depending on their anthropometrics and their archetype, depending on their injury history, and then, of course, depending on their demand for sport. So if we have a variety of different athletes that, that have different sports and different archetypes, we are going to have a difference in programming and a difference in the way in which those programs are being organized and implemented. If we want to focus on developing the myotendinous properties, we need to emphasize longitudinal and compressive forces. So this is really focusing in on the myotendinous junctions. We're thinking about transmitting force vertically or purely horizontally. We're thinking about the potential energy storage, and this is, again, the predominant mechanism for force transmission. So we're really just thinking functional strength and power, which we can see over here on these two, two uh, images. You know, a, a simple pogo hop, straight up, straight down, thinking about short ground contact time, stiffness at the ankle, and then, you know, a conventional deadlift here. There's nothing wrong with these things at all, and there's absolutely a time for those to be applied. But equally, if we look at the myofascial properties, we're thinking more about the lateral or the shearing forces that are experienced. So we're thinking more towards those myofascial force expressions, how we're transmitting force or energy laterally rather than linearly, the dispersion of mechanical energy, and then understanding that this is the supporting mechanism for force transmission. So more so focused on the actualization of functional speed and skill. So again, irrespective of who the athlete is, where they are, what they're doing, both sides are going to be required. It's really just a matter of understanding where they are and then what they need. So how much of each are we going to apply based on those things? And for the myofascial properties, this one is a really good example here where we have almost this like pendulum lunge action using the landmine. And for this, I'm having Melvin jump into that single leg position with the barbell to his left side here. So not only are we getting the linear deceleration by jumping forward, but because of the angulation of the barbell and the landmine, we are now getting some ipsilateral trunk bending. We are getting the, the demand to control dynamic valgus at the knee. We're getting the compliance of the foot and being able to differentiate between more supinated versus pronated, pressuring, pressurizing through the foot. And this is one where if I had a 15 year old kid who's you know got one or two years of training under their belt we're obviously not going to do this this would be a dumbbell goblet hold and we would you know step back into a reverse lunge and step forward into a forward lunge but it's somebody at his level you know this is just kind of adding that next layer to it similarly here rather than just having this athlete holding two dumbbells with bilateral stance for an RDL variation I'm having him use the landmine and doing this in almost like a cross body pattern. So now we are getting more demand for rotational mechanics at the hips, specifically the ability for the pelvis to rotate atop a fixed femur. There's going to be more demand down at the foot, which is going to implicate more of the lower leg. And then the positioning of the trunk is going to be a little bit more of a reaching or a reciprocating pattern rather than just isometrically flexing at the trunk, um, you know, again, in a linear fashion.